if you invest in diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you invest in social justice or social impact or sustainability, this is how we can drive value to all of these key stakeholders and actually track KPIs and track performance that we can report on that will enhance the value of this company. Right. So that is a really important skill set if we want to use the power of capitalism to harness any of that power to do good in this world. We have to be able to convert. Let's talk about doing the right thing and also doing the right thing that's going to support the finances of this company. Back to black. Hilary Black's reputation precedes her. Over the last 25 years, she has tirelessly advocated for access to cannabis on behalf of those who need it in Canada, first via Hemp BC, then through the BC Compassion Club, and more recently at Canopy Growth, where she served as Chief Advocacy Officer. Now an independent consultant, she explains what the Canadian cannabis industry can teach the rest of the world as new legal markets open up, and she looks at the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. And here we are. Welcome to the Lobster Pot Podcast. I'm Dave Barton. And who have we got here? We've got uh, Jamie, what's your name? Bonthron, Bonus Throners. Where's your rubber Johnners? Welcome to the show, sir. Uh, co-host. Dave, I'm really, uh, I really appreciate that you started with that intro. I unfortunately forgot the rude rhyme that you gave me for yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, it had something to do with Tartan, Barton. What? There's a whole thing. Barton. yeah you know it's just we're just taking it back to the playground keeping it real you know just taking ourselves a peg or two down because you know we no one needs inflated egos so absolutely you know, be it's humble important. be humble stay humble stay low blow like hootie no that's something else isn't it but anyway we have a very special guest today we have a lady who has been well known in canada particularly canadian cannabis in british columbia for the past oh 25 years, which is amazing because she's still only 30 years old. It's Hilary Black, of course. Welcome, Hilary, to the show. It's an honor to have you. How are you doing today? Thank you. Great to see both of you guys. A little uh, a transatlantic conversation mm. today. Got my tea going, considering that I'm chatting with oh, okay. from the UK. Thought that was appropriate. Yeah, no, absolutely. Although I actually, actually hate tea. It's uh, one of my most despised beverages, but that's just me. I'm being British is probably the greatest failure of my life, I have to say. But, you know, it's not about me today. It's all about you. So Hemp BC, BC Compassion Club, Canopy Growth, your reputation kind of precedes you. So tell us, a little, for those that don't know you, tell us just a little bit about some of the work you've done and, and where you are today, Hilary. It's uh, very impressive. Uh, well, I never planned on a career as a cannabis activist and professional. I think that happens to many of us. Um, I was taking a little bit of time off after high school to figure out what direction I wanted to take my career in. Um, and I started learning about hemp. And I learned about how hemp could really make a huge difference to our planet in terms of hemp for paper, hemp for building materials, uh, hemp for food, hemp for, you know, sequestering carbon and all of the incredible things that plant can do. And at that time, the medical cannabis movement was just beginning in California. So Dennis Perone had opened the first real big cannabis buyers club and a hemp store opened in Vancouver. It was the first hemp store in Canada and I was fascinated. So I started showing up every day until I became annoying enough that they just hired me. Um, and there I read all the books and got to learn all about medical cannabis. And it was a wild time. We sold seeds, which was a very big deal in the, this was like 1994, 1995. Um, and I got arrested for selling seeds, my first, first but not last time getting arrested. And they charged me with trafficking an unlimited amount of marijuana, which I thought was very cool. My parents... Ooh really not quite see the like honor yeah, in yeah. This charging an unlimited amount of marijuana and that charge doesn't actually even exist um in the end those charges were dropped but i did have the pleasure of spending a day and a night in jail uh it's the only time i have been to jail which is yeah. a bit surprising considering how many laws i have broken but you know being a privileged white woman you kind of have that to your advantage um, we started smoking cannabis publicly at 420, and that was a huge deal to be encouraging people 
um, we would line up behind the counter and we would yell out, it's 420, smoke them if you got them. And that summer, that store got packed out every afternoon. People lined up down the street because it was this real anomaly to have people encouraging actually the public consumption of cannabis. I became in contact with a lot of patients while I worked there. So it was mostly HIV and AIDS patients that at the time, that was really the health health crisis the country was facing then. And I just started learning as much as I could so that I could be answering the questions to all of the patients that were coming to the store with their questions. And eventually we started a small delivery service. Wow. And that became the uh, BC Compassion Club. Yeah, it started with a uh, Motorola pager and a mountain equipment co-op backpack and a very old bicycle. Uh, and eventually we did grow it into a community-based nonprofit organization. Before I started the Compassion Club, I spent a year working in Amsterdam. So I had the opportunity to go to Holland and work in an incredible company called Positronics. And I got to distribute hash and grass and kind of learn what it felt like to be in an environment where it, you know, prohibition didn't exist. Came home and yeah, built the Compassion Club. And it was a really incredible organization in that we provided free alternative health care. So herbalists, nutritionists, counselors, massage therapy to oh. all our clients. And that was really the spoonful of sugar that made the medicine go down in terms of the authorities, all levels of government and the medical community, most importantly, really supporting the work that we were doing. And so to what extent do you feel like that played a direct part in helping you know change the stigma at least because we're talking about if we're talking about sort of mid late 90s i mean it was still 20 or more years before you know rec legalization at least in canada when did medical legalization officially happen uh well it sort of happened in phases like okay. there was a coalition of people who dragged the government kicking and screaming and it we got little bits at a time. So originally a patient could uh, purchase from one company that was working with the government that didn't grow particularly high quality cannabis. Then people got the right to grow for themselves. Then people got the right to choose a grower to grow for them. It's and the kind then, of micro growers that you have. It's, it's yeah, that sort exactly. of, yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And then we got to, um, the the real federal uh legislated uh, landscape um mm -hmm. was in about 2015 and that's when we had some of the first big companies that had the licenses given out so the first big 12 companies were granted mm -hmm. the first commercial licenses to be able to produce and distribute cannabis and is that just medical cannabis back then 2015 yeah. medical oh. cannabis yeah because okay. that was still i mean so you've kind of got this long sort of legacy and then sort of 2015 it starts to become a bit more commonplace and then just three years later it's complete sort of wreck legalization I and mean, do you think i mean was that those three years did it, did it feel like a particularly sort of accelerated journey or was it kind of like everything has been in place for quite a while things just need to happen someone needs to back it did, did it well, kind of feel like that personally it was an accelerated journey because i went being like the queen of the rebels, you know, civilly disobedient, helping people across the country to break the law in the same way that we were teaching them how to run their organization so that they didn't get raided and hauled off to jail, mm -hmm. um, dealing with, you know, thousands and thousands of critically and chronically ill people that were counting on us every single day. Uh, and it was a it was a it was a very much a community based nonprofit kind of front lines organization. When those first 12 licenses were given out, I went to work for Bedrocam and I fell very hard from my activist pedestal. And I was one of the first big um, sort of pioneering activists to move into the corporate world. And I certainly took a tremendous a lot of amount of flack for it. Um, but I wanted to work where the seat of power was changing. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a sort of a new table yeah terms of where decisions were being made and where resources were being flowed through and I wanted to participate sort of in the new world order. So in terms of when you say you got a lot of flack for kind of joining kind of demand kind of thing in inverted commas was that people saw that as a bit of a, a renegade move in some respects but then you ended up working for Canopy Growth which is like 
you know. Yeah. So I mean, they called me a sellout and a traitor and mm. all, all all kinds of things like that. But I I mean, Bedrocan was an incredible company, still is an incredible company. Uh, got bought by Tweed, and that was the first big merger and acquisition that happened in Canada. And they inherited me for better or for worse, like a goat in a real estate deal when they bought the farm. And the that crew was great to me. I mean, it was very much a men's club when those first big licenses were given out. The movement went from being pretty female led and very diverse to being very white and very male um, because it was folks that were coming in from venture capital, mining, tobacco, pharma, alcohol that had the capital and the capacity to get those licenses to overcome those really significant barriers to entry to get into the marketplace. Um, but that early Tweed crew that became the Canopy Growth leadership team, they really truly honored and respected my expertise and my opinions coming from the grassroots and coming from the history that I had. And they also knew that consumers wanted some credibility and authenticity from the people they were purchasing their cannabis from. So I actually had a wonderful journey working with that crew and you know took myself from being a director to being the first female member of the c-suite at canopy growth awesome mm -hmm. it's a pretty decent effort i mean hindsight is a wonderful thing because it's so crystal clear but do you think that uh legalization both medical and recreational kind of turned out how you thought it would you came from being a renegade into a into a a legal environment i imagine that shift was probably quite jarring at times um you know in in the way that you have to make decisions in business as opposed to how you make decisions when you're doing something a little bit more organic um how, how do you think it panned out and do you think it has done well done badly what's it done right what's it done wrong that's a really big question so yeah, pick one of you like. a couple questions in there and they're all great so the first one that i'll unpack is to say that uh, learning how to get a business to fund doing the right thing, but being able to bring it back to ROI has been an incredible journey for me, really. Like I basically got to embezzle my MBA from a bunch of incredibly smart people and learn how to teach a board or a leadership team if you invest in diversity equity and inclusion if you invest in social justice or social impact or sustainability this is how we can drive value to all of these key stakeholders and actually track kpis and track performance that we can report on that will enhance the value of this company right so that is a really important skill set if we want to use the power of capitalism to harness any of that power to do good in this world we have to be able to convert let's talk about doing the right thing and also doing the right thing that's going to support the finances of this company so that's really precious and i kind of can't wait to get that toolkit back to work before we talk about how we've managed legalization in Canada, the first thing that I have to say is that I'm incredibly proud of my country for being the first in the on the global stage to be willing to take also some flack, as I did back in the day, um, from you know some of our our international colleagues and the countries that we have very important trading relationships with. Very proud of my country for getting it done. The incredible amount of work that happened in Ottawa on the Hill to get this bill passed and the regulatory framework in place. With that said, <laughs> there are a number of things that I wouldn't want to replicate in other countries and that I hope that we will correct here. When it comes to patients, the first thing is that we don't have cannabis in the pharmacies here and we should. That's just like straight up, cannabis should be available through the pharmacies in Canada, uh, and they're not. Um, one of the things that we got right that I think is very important to talk about on the international stage is that the sky did not fall. There's no more driving accidents. There's not an increase in youth use. There is not an increase in uh, mental health or um, other kind of like psychological issues in connection with cannabis. There is an increase in uh, hospitalizations, which actually is positive because what that means, I think, is that when people are having a negative experience with cannabis, they're actually willing to go and talk to a physician in an emergency room about it because they can say, I'm using cannabis, rather than having that negative experience on their own. So from a public health perspective, this has been a wild success. 
from a financial perspective, not so much in Canada. So fundamentally, we legalized cannabis with a prohibitionist mentality. We said, we're going to legalize cannabis. We're going to regulate it so that we can address the harms associated with cannabis. We're going to keep it out of the hands of youth. We're going to keep money out of the hands of organized crime. We're going to regulate the product so that it's safe. That's how we sold legalization through the conservative parts of our government. What we didn't do was say prohibition is based on 100 years of lies and racism. Let's unpack this and actually look at why the United States originally put cannabis prohibition laws in the books. Let's actually look at the consequences that it's had to our black, brown and indigenous communities. And let's build a cannabis act and a regulatory and a regulatory framework that is geared towards calling it out and addressing it. So we didn't do that, right? So what happened is some of the stigma from prohibition that again is based in racism has permeated our regulatory framework. So what that means is that the industry is overregulated, there's way too much required surveillance and reporting, and it's overtaxed, dramatically overtaxed. And these are some of the things that are strangling the industry in Canada at the moment. And it's really important, I think, to understand how the racist basis of prohibition found its way into the regulatory framework and it's killing business in Canada. And the reason that I love talking about this right now is because I don't mm. want to see other countries make the same mistake because some people with some ambitious capitalist interests, which, you know, everybody has a right to, you know, build a successful company, believes that if cannabis is regulated in a highly, highly regulated environment, it's going to give a competitive advantage to a few companies. And in truth, you're just going to end up strangling the whole industry. Does that make sense? You guys following me? Yeah, no, no. It's it's just there's so many. Again, there's there's so much to kind of unpack there. And what's something that always strikes me with 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 cannabis is that you just scratch the surface, and it gets just like a political, just kind of pyramid, just sort of pops up and goes. Hey, don't forget about this and this and this and this, and it's kind of like okay, cool. To kind of understand that, I mean. In, I guess more so, I mean, we've we've often spoken to people and we try and get a kind of global perspective on things when we interview a lot of people. And I think something that really strikes us, I mean, obviously, we feel like, you know, cannabis more so is a kind of North American phenomenon, kind of more so than it is a European one. Not to say it's not a Latin American, but I think in terms of, you know, USA and Canada are probably the most mature kind of commercial markets in the world right now. Um, but at a lot of the kind of issues underpinning that, things like social equity and equality and diversity and, and you know, giving people who've been affected by the war on drugs their, you know, an advantage, you know, very, very important. And I think absolutely need to 100% be replicated elsewhere. But I'm just wondering to what extent it becomes an issue in other countries like Germany or France or the UK. I mean, actually, when we went to Cannabis Europa earlier this year, we again, made a particular play to kind of do a video and talk to people about diversity and equality and things like that. And we were talking to a, a black MP here in the UK and she was telling us how, you know, one of the things that she really likes to do is to kind of help young people who've got a kind of drug conviction to actually get work experience in her office to kind of, again, kind of negate, you know, to basically she's explained the decriminalization in a way that, you know, just completely went against what we understood it as, you know, as again, this white privilege, white, middle-aged in my case not jamie's men who are you know very much kind of like well decriminalization all that means is i can't get busted if someone if i'm you know for possession or whatever as long as i've got a small amount but for people in in the cities you know people of color who have sort of started along that path you know it's like well everything is kind of against you at that point so it's easy to follow a path that's kind of how she explained it to me and i guess a lot of those issues it's almost like oh i didn't realize that and again that comes from a place of wanting to learn and wanting to understand more from my but again kind of almost being cocooned away from a lot of that and it's almost like when you have so many different countries with such vast varied sort of histories and kind of political you know histories as well it's kind of like well how is a lot how can we use cannabis as a force for good in those kind of scenarios do you know what i mean and it's i can see how as you've kind of explained through your work that's kind of happened you know in Canada and that whole trajectory, that whole story, that journey you've been on is sort of like, 
how does that work in places like Germany, for example, as you know, when you kind of it feels like, well, it's kind of overregulated, but are they doing enough to kind of help communities that have been impacted? Is there enough kind of opportunity for smaller companies to to grow and thrive? You know, is there an opportunity? Do you see what I mean? It's like, how do you kind of navigate a lot of those kind of cultural issues, but still looking at what your what's happened in in places where it has been successful and i suppose it's it's really just case by case basis and i think for me that that i mean but for someone like you who you kind of seen and you're almost kind of at the cutting edge of a lot of these different markets watching them kind of open up and going ah right maybe they should be doing that do you think that's the case or do you feel like you know there are sort of blanket lessons that different countries can learn sort of culturally and kind of adapt them or do we need to completely new uh way in for to help different countries kind of understand what it means to operate a legal market i'm sorry that's about 15 questions in one again um it's kind of kind of speculation more than anything else but well, what's your take on that sort of thing we can unpack a few things in there i mean mm. first of all i am just sort of earning my expertise in the global markets mm -hmm. uh, i do know that when i speak internationally and i ask audiences how many of them could explain to a regulator about mm. the prohibitionist or about the racist history of prohibition in America? How many of them would feel comfortable teaching a regulator about that history? And are they prepared to teach a regulator about how and why America exported prohibition to their country? Very few people put up their hands, right? So um these are maybe interesting issues that as an educator you could use your platform to help kind of bring along your mm. community particularly in places outside of canada and the us right like do you feel like you could give a really good explanation of what harry anslinger did and what happened when the jim crow laws came off the books and how all of that is kind of led into like mass incarcerations and what did it mean for america to start exporting mm. cannabis to or ex not for exporting cannabis i wish exporting prohibition to germany and jamaica and europe and what they mm. leveraged to get it done um I think that that's our responsibility, right? Yeah. As as us being educators and advocates, yes. we want to bring other people along on that journey, and particularly the professionals that are focusing their government relations activities on getting the license and getting the things that they need, like just for their business. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that we talk about why unpacking this history is good for business. Right. It's not just about doing the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. But let's look at what happens when you create a regulatory framework for cannabis in a way that addresses some of these issues. And there are some small companies, small countries that have examples of international success. So it's kind of a big, a big answer to. Yeah, no, no, no. I think I think no, I don't understand where you're coming from. And I think it's it's interesting because, again, taking, like you say, the sort of prohibitionist stance that has been you know prevalent in the US and sort of explaining that this has impacted what cannabis you know the growth of cannabis as an industry you know and or you know like no it's something to understand the history of it like you say and that you know it might not be directly relevant to something that happens in Luxembourg or Germany or Czech Republic but you know there's a lot of oh, okay well we understand why this is changing why it's changing there and why it might be changing here and what we need to do or what we need to address locally and in order to kind of do the right thing by the industry because i'm still very much that you know this is still it still feels like a very young industry and it's kind of like there's still the opportunity i mean i'm ever the optimist to kind of you know create the industry we want to see you know more so than other you know it's not as well established as you know mining or technology you know that's still very like you know we can do good here i need a little bit of your enthusiasm can you just like put some of that in a package and share anytime it? anytime yeah <laughs> absolutely because i have been so passionate about this industry i mean i literally have dedicated my adult life to um 
freeing cannabis from the chains that bind her. And I want to see that happen globally so that we can have the medical impact. So much suffering can be relieved. Uh, addressing the social justice issues, getting people out of cages and jails and, and uh, unleashing the power of the hemp plant to help deal with climate change and some of the very pressing issues that are facing us. Um, so in Canada, and what I've seen in the US is that particularly around George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, there was, when that real uprising was happening, there was an incredible pressure on corporate culture to be like, what are you doing about diversity, equity, and inclusion in your company? Particularly for cannabis companies, how are you addressing social justice issues? And then even starting to get into sustainability reporting and starting to address the fact that our industry currently is a major, major contributor to carbon outputs, right? How, where's the conversation about how we're gonna start mitigating and managing and decarbonizing our industry? And as the, some companies made some good efforts. I did an excellent ESG report with my team at Canopy starting to address the sustainability issues. But as the markets are bottoming out, both in Canada and the US, capital is drying up and there is a lot of uh, right sizing and downsizing and market corrections that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, those functions are getting cut across many, many companies. And one of the things that I think is integral for building sustainable markets, but also for building sustainable, healthy companies that your consumers are going to love and your regulators are going to love is actually for a cannabis company, a function around impact, whether that's community impact, social justice, sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion should be seen as integral as your HR and your IT department, right? We can't treat cannabis and our companies and our industry like any other CPG product. It is not a widget. It's not licorice. It's not Barbie dolls. It's not wheat. Like in order to have successful companies and successful industries and to spread this global movement, which we're still doing around the world, we have to address the functions that come with the major social shift that moving cannabis into a regulated market requires. And that's education and all of the other things that I just rattled off. I don't know if I can play devil's advocate, but I'm going to try. Oh, so I'm going to go toe to toe with someone who probably knows a lot more than I do, but I'll do my best. Please, bring it. ESG for many companies comes almost as an afterthought. And that is as a result of it becoming a budgetary pressure, as you mentioned there, where there's a consolidation, there's a market that's struggling. People don't want to spend money on things that they feel don't generate value for their business. Mm -hmm. certainly in the short term because that's really what it comes down to is short termism how do you think you know you can best communicate that to companies within cannabis that this stuff really is important you mentioned it there talking about diversity and inclusion you know uh social responsibility be it climate anything like that i suppose that's the impact part of it isn't it it's like how could you say what the impact of this right now for your business is okay well straight up dollars and cents two of the only companies that are profitable in Canada right now, um, Rubicon and Aqualitas, both uh, also run by women, I just have to say, happen to be. They are, they've kept their commitments and they do excellent work around sustainability reporting, diversity, equity, inclusion. And they also happen to grow incredibly high quality cannabis and their consumers love them and they sell out of their product. I mean, those companies are also um, smaller, agile, asset light, and able to pivot to meet market demands as what consumers are requiring are shifting. But they have um, great influence with their regulators, from what I understand. I'm not inside those companies, but more importantly, they have consumer loyalty because they have built trust and built community around their companies. And then it goes hand in hand with a really high quality product. And both of those companies are doing really well. So there's one sort of dollars and cents incentive. The other side is uh, the stick. That was the carrot. There's also, I also walk with a big stick. So the stick looks like this. The UN, not the UN, the EU has passed 
corporate sustainability reporting disclosure requirements. So the CSRD, there's always so many acronyms. And it is the most aggressive, highest standard requirements for reporting on sustainability that has been really legislated around the world. So publicly traded companies have to start doing this reporting at the end of this year. That's quick. Small and medium-sized enterprises, which many of the cannabis companies that are operating in Europe right now are going to fall into scope, are going to be required to do this kind of sustainability reporting in the next two years. So I don't know if you know much about sustainability reporting, but scope one and scope two is basically reporting on your own impact. Scope three is you're reporting on the impact of your supply chain. It's a much more comprehensive thing to have to report on. You have to start thinking about building partners in your supply chain that have the capacity to do their own reporting so that you can do your reporting. And what I saw doing Canopy's ESG report is that there was a tremendous amount of fundamental systems that we had not put in place. And course correcting those things become more expensive and more time consuming the more complex your company becomes, right? So I actually have a whole other rant and talk we could get into another time that's about 12 strategies that I've developed that's for small and medium size and early stage cannabis companies that wanna start positioning themselves to be able to do sustainability reporting or to be able to do some kind of ESG reporting in the future. And these are the things that you have to think about now and you can make little course corrections, start getting the systems in place, start getting the right talent. Otherwise, the longer you wait, it becomes exponentially more expensive. Absolutely. Oh, cool. That's slam dunk. I'm going to say it was a devil's advocate layup there because I'm I'm pretty fully in agreement with it. It makes so much sense because what you're doing is you're streamlining all of the kind of regulatory requirements that you have to, you know, uh, adhere to, and at the same time you're also building brand and 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 strengthening yeah. loyalty within your customer base. It makes yeah. perfect sense. And Germany has a, a supply chain law that's come, a new law that's coming into effect. And I'm not going to try to pronounce it because it's like 25 letters long. And in German, I could write it out for you. But they have a supply chain law that's coming into effect that will also affect cannabis companies working in Germany and even some that are importing and exporting out of Germany. From what I understand, I'm not an expert on it yet. I'm learning about it. But it's an amazing piece of legislation because it doesn't just require sustainability reporting, but it has a real focus on um, uh, human rights and labor rights. And so it's gonna require, again, it's these reporting mechanisms that this legislation is gonna require. And these are the kinds of things that companies can start thinking about with a little bit of help from some people that have been through it to start figuring out how to put the systems in place so that it you don't hit you're not gonna hit a wall and it suddenly is like a panic and a really expensive thing to be able to comply with some of this legislation that's coming down in Europe. So I mean that's the stick side of it is that it's coming whether you like it or not in terms of the requirements to do some reporting. And then the carrot side is all about the ways that that kind of work adds value. And for companies that are moving into recreational cannabis, and I know, again, that's more Canadian and American right now, but I think we have hopes that we'll get into those markets in Germany and in Australia and in other places. In my experience, and according to a lot of the market research data that I've been exposed to, cannabis consumers care about this stuff, right? They want a relationship with the company that's producing their cannabis and they want to be able to trust them and they want to know that they're doing good authentic work and we've really seen the market shift in canada if you look at the market share pie how it's gone from like the big four or big five companies really owning most of the market to that market share becoming much 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 smaller as these smaller companies that have authenticity and have credibility with their cannabis consumers are starting to eat up the majority of the market here so so yeah it just kind of makes sense that you know 
again, coming back to the idea that, you know, we have an opportunity to build the industry in a positive way. It's, it's already happening. And when you start to think of it in legislative and regulatory terms as well, and you think, ah, that's because that allows you to do that. And that's a good thing. It's almost kind of unpicking that and getting companies and individuals to sort of see that ah, the reason that this might seem like a whole load of hurdles to come across is that eventually it's going to make things a lot more robust and a lot more, you know, equitable for everyone moving forward. And I think that's what we all want. Oh, this is really my hope. I mean, in the heyday in the Canadian market, as we're heading into legalization, when the capital markets were like throwing buckets of money at us, gold was like falling out of the sky, literally. Like I was with Canopy when Constellation put five billion, but billion with a B, five billion dollars into the company. <laughs> Um, there was a real race across a lot of the Canadian cannabis companies to be showing performance around social justice and diversity and social impact, all the things that we're talking about. Um, and now that it's difficult to be profitable, to put it lightly, mm -hmm. in the Canadian marketplace, for all the reasons that we've talked about, um, a lot of those functions have been cut right? Including me and my team, honestly, right? Like that's why I'm not with Canopy anymore is that they needed to do go through another huge restructuring and that decided that the prioritizing resources on the kind of work that we're talking about uh, needed, the priorities needed to be rearranged. So I, I pray that we get back to a place where uh, these kinds of functions really are being prioritized, particularly with the really large publicly traded companies that I think have the greatest responsibility. Very cool, very cool. And just to kind of, I mean, you know, we could go on for hours. I think it'd be great to just, um, as we kind of wrap up, just to kind of get a little bit of perspective, what do you think uh, the next five years hold for cannabis in Canada in particular? And you know, maybe where do you think, I mean, do you really think that Germany is going to be the next to, to go wreck or do you think somewhere else might? What, what's, your, what's your thought for Canada and for the rest of the world? I mean, for Canada, I think that we are on an upswing. Like, I think things are starting to improve. I hope. I mean, I there is, you know, a couple of my favorite companies that unfortunately have shut down. Um, but over the course of the next five years, the survivors are going to emerge and they are going to emerge victorious, right? So I think there's going to be two kinds of survivors. One are the companies that have a massive war chest that actually can afford to uh, bankroll themselves until they get back into profitability and will continue to see uh, more mergers and acquisitions and more consolidation in the market. I do not want to see the cannabis market end up looking like the beer market where you have like four or five huge companies and then a couple of little micros. I think that we're going to see the craft cultivators that are scraping by right now with like razor thin margins, but they're managing to pay their taxes and they're building a niche in the marketplace for themselves where they're interesting strains some of the nice sort of i know we don't use indica and sativa anymore but some of the nice like stimulating haze kind of varieties they're taking the time mm -hmm. to throw out the kind of cultivars that like snooty cannabis consumers like us really enjoy and they're doing it they're doing a beautiful job of their cure and their trim and they're selling out right and they're gonna hopefully survive this like this kind of shakeout period yeah, no, absolutely. Be interesting. I mean, what do you think on, on the subject of, of Germany and other countries? What do you think? Um, I always think, I mean, what was I going to say? I was going to talk about Germany and Thailand just, just very briefly. You've got this idea. I, I always see them as kind of like polar opposites in terms of Thailand said, hey, let's legalize it. We'll regulate afterwards. And then Germany sort of said, no, we need to regulate it and figure out what that means. But everyone, you know, you get the impression that could take some time. Uh, what What's your kind of preferred approach? And do you think, you know, somewhere in the middle is probably the right way forward for a lot of countries or I think, be... some, I think somewhere in the middle is is probably the right way forward i mean if you wait too long you can end up with unregulated shenanigans so like in vancouver 
we had a period of time where there was hundreds and hundreds of unregulated dispensaries, right? I was just talking with a colleague from New York that was telling me that one of the issues that's happening in New York is you have this small amount of licenses that were granted, but now there's hundreds and hundreds of unlicensed dispensaries and you can buy weed at like any bodega. And I don't know that that's the way that you want to go either. Like I really do like cannabis being in a regulated environment so that it is um, tested. I want to make sure that there's no heavy metals and terrible pesticides and all of the other crap that can end up in unregulated cannabis. And also so people have access to really good education platforms, right? I think if you have a well-regulated market, you can really reduce the amount of negative experiences that people have with cannabis because you can support them to approach it in a really safe and smart way. And I think that that's incredibly important. And, you know, I come back to sort of my thesis around the more that we are teaching regulators about the truth, about the history of prohibition in America and understand why did Germany take on America's prohibitionist policies, what were the pressures and the economic forces that were at play at that time, the more we can take an interest in actually unpacking the history and talking about it and teaching about it, the more likely we get to overcome stigma and end up with good policy. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been uh, it's been a real education and really, really interesting to speak with you. And uh, we finally got there. We This is like the third attempt we, <laughs> we made to kind of make this interview. But I'm so glad we did. And it's been it's been awesome. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing what you do next, Hilary. So thank you so much for coming on. And um, we will speak again. So thank you. Quite a pleasure to chat with you guys. And next time, I'd really like to meet your dog, please. Yes, absolutely. I shall um, bring him, I'll dress him up as a little person, bring him on a plane and we'll go to one of the conferences. Be great. <laughs> we'll be cool. Alrighty. Have a great week and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you Thanks, so much. Cheers. Thanks.